What am I gonna steal? Who am I gonna rip off to get more heroin? That's what my life consisted of. My story is different from a lot of people, man. I didn't have that like troubled background, you know, or you know, abusive parents or something. Or my parents were great. I was born in Ventura, California, and uh, I was four and I moved to Phoenix. Nice, quiet place called Maryvale. I started riding dirt bikes like at a young age, man. Like I said, I had everything a kid could ask for, man. I, I got good grades in school. Uh, my dad was a wild hippie. So like the polar opposites, but they, they were perfect for each other. My dad took me to see Pink Floyd when I was 12. That was the first time I really like kind of got high, but just from being engulfed in, in the smoke. You know, I, I played a lot of music saxophone, guitar, trumpet, keyboard. I was always involved in a lot of uh, extracurricular activities. And at 13, I smoked weed for the first time. And right then was like that I found the next best thing. Like it was, it just, everything clicked. That's what that smell was all the time when my dad said, it's just cigarettes. I'm like, that, that was, no, I, I knew right then. And so that justified it in my mind that this was okay behavior. I still got good grades in school and it was always like pedal to metal for me. I would never be able to smoke just a little bit of weed. I started with other drugs, started raving in the early 90s, ecstasy, lots of acid, mushrooms. All of a sudden, my, my, I came home from school and uh, my parents told me we were moving to Texas and I had like a week's notice. The only thing I could think about was like, how am I going to get drugs out in Texas? And so I brought a bunch of weed with me and I now I'm transplanted in this like different area it's like people are different out there than what i grew up with in arizona everybody had like a chip on their shoulder man trying to be tough and hard and it was that like kind of like you know uh it was just everybody loves to fight you know i was the new kid in town but i had good weed so i started selling weed and uh i remember the first time man where like my life really took a turn i got set up for like a half ounce of weed by this girl and she took me to a party and they were there to rob me I got the crap kicked out of me, man. Like my head split open my, down to the bone of my eye. My uh, orbitals fractured over here on the side. My eyes completely swollen shut. And so I managed to get home, but I'm staring in the mirror, like, and blood squirting out of my head. Like, and all I can think about is like, how am I gonna do a line when I have blood squirting out of my head? And like, at this point, I'm never gonna let this happen again. Not by not doing it, but I'm gonna start carrying a gun. That's what I did. I took it even higher. I started running around with gangs. I got hooked up with a dude whose uncle was in the cartel and I started running drugs from Juarez and I took it to the next level. And I had that reputation like I was gonna be the baddest motherfucker on the planet. And uh, the years went by. Like, my buddy called me, he was like, hey, let's make another run. And I heard this voice in my head clear as day, man. It said, Chris, don't do this. And uh, I listened and that dude is doing 40 years right now. Like, cause that trip he got arrested. 15 kilos in the trunk, uh, thousands of Xanax. I got a phone call that my mom was sick. And so I came home, we took her to the hospital and uh, she had ovarian cancer. And I was 18 years old at this time. Of course, man, like, like drug addicts do, man, we make everything about ourselves. And so I was like, God dealt me this unfair hand. This God's against me. Like, how could he do this to my mother who's like the sweetest person on earth? And so I just went even harder, started taking more Xanax, just drinking a lot. And uh, eventually my mom died three years later. And uh, when my mom died, I just didn't care anymore. I was just like, I want something that's gonna numb the pain as much as possible. And I called up my buddy who I always knew had heroin. And uh, that was it, man, from, from that first shot of heroin, it was like, this is, this is it. Like it numbed my pain. I didn't care about anything anymore. I stopped the whole gang life thing because all I did was sh sit in a room and shoot heroin. But, you know, that you know, might have been God looking out for me on that one, man, because I was doing some pretty wild stuff. I was an IT engineer for a major computer company in, in Texas. A lot of people that I worked with were, were clientele. So that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's what it was just like. This is OK behavior. I was successful. You know, everybody that I, I knew and really higher ups too, not just coworkers, they were they were buying from me. So it just justified it for me. I can still manage to work. I can still, you know, have a nice place to live. I lived in a badass apartment in downtown Dallas, you know, up on, you know, overlooking one way you look and it's the freeway, the other way looks the freeway. And it, it was right next to American Airlines Center where the, uh, the stars and the Mavericks played. I had strippers that would come over all the time. I lived with a couple strippers for a couple years. Fortunately, man, my family, like 
they didn't want anything to do with me at this point. Like they were like, we're done with you. you you're not gonna change, you know, you're, you're high at your mother's funeral. I just ran everything to the ground, man. I worked for this company for 10 years. I was like pissed at the company for laying me off. Like, do you not know who I think I am? They had to let me go because I was a heroin addict. Like they gave me a reduction in workforce package where I got severance pay. I got it because I had been worked there for so long, but I'm gonna move back to Arizona where I don't know anybody that's doing heroin. But in my mind, like I'm not doing heroin anymore. I have another great IT job. I have a condo out in Scottsdale, a truck, a, a Harley. Like you deserve to have a little bit of heroin is what my brain tells me. Like it's been a month and a, a month, month and a half. That one time turned into another eight years. Up until I, I got into treatment, like I hadn't had a day sober since I was 13. I went through numerous other jobs. And, I, and then if, eventually I got a job in the IT field working from home just on my laptop because I was only engineer who could work on these big Sun Microsystems 15K racks. I get a call like 1 a.m. and they're like, hey, you got to go work on this system. I'm like, cool, where is it? They're like, New York City. I'm like, Whoa, okay, when am I leaving? Like, they're like, in five hours. The thought that goes through my mind is, how am I gonna get heroin to New York City? I actually went through a body scan machine with heroin in my butt. God somehow intervened and then they didn't see it. So eventually I got fired uh, for showing up to sites high. And, and of course I denied it up and down. And they would have sent me to treatment if I would have admitted something. And eventually, you know, I get kicked out. I start living with one of my dealers. I get kicked out of his place because my drug dealer is telling me I need help. He's also a heroin addict. And he's telling me I need help. I was doing a lot of stuff where I had no idea what I was doing. Speeding on my motorcycle, I got my license suspended for six years. And so, but I still drove, you know, and then eventually, you know, I got in a car accident and totaled the car. So I couldn't get another car because I don't have a license. And uh, that was it. I didn't care about anything else. I hadn't talked to my family in probably four to five years. Like uh, my little cousin who I grew up with, who was really close to me, like she was murdered and I wasn't able to go to her funeral. She was 15 years old. I'm glad that they didn't get to see me like that because it, yeah, it's still, I had to make amends to them. I had finally found the one friend that I hadn't manipulated yet and he let me move in with him. Eventually, maybe probably a year and a half after that, uh, I wound up stealing his credit card number and forging one of his checks. And I didn't even know I did it. Like, and he called me eventually, you know, like a, probably a month later and was just like, dude, I can't believe you did this. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't, I didn't do anything. He's like, dude, I'm looking at the video and all of the charges, the video from you cashing the check and all of the charges to and from your, your dope dealer's house. It's Cause I was using his credit card for Lyft and Uber. So he told me that, you know, if I was really blacked out and I didn't know what I was doing, then I would call the police on myself. So I was like, all right, dude. I'm gonna do it. And it, it took me like probably five hours to get there because I kept blacking out on the train and waking up in different parts of the city, but I made it. Eventually I made it and I called the police on myself. You know, all my bags packed, ready to go. Uh, my bags being the clothes that I had on me at the time. I didn't own anything else. That was it. I told my buddy, I'm like, dude, I'm ready to go to prison. You know, I'd been arrested a handful of times at this point. And uh, I knew with my past that I was going to prison for a few years. Like I was ready to go because I didn't want to do this anymore. So my, my buddy looks at the cops and, and they're like, what do you think? And the cops say prison isn't going to help him. He needs to go to treatment. Have you ever been to rehab before? I'm like, no, never been to treatment, anything like that. And they're like, great, go into treatment tomorrow. And if he doesn't go, you can file charges against him. Next day, he took me into Crossroads and do admissions. And uh, this is where it's, the story starts getting crazy, man. Like after everything I told you, you think that was nuts? This is where it gets really nuts for me. I go to Crossroads, he picks me up the next morning, takes me in and uh, I just shot up the rest of my stuff. And uh, they say in Crossroads that like, you have to piss clean for opiates and benzos or you can't get in. And I'm like, what do you think I'm doing here, dude? I have a problem, I can't stop. If I could piss clean, that means I would have been able to stop. I could never do it. So they told me, this is on a Wednesday, all right, I have to come back on a Monday and piss clean. So I go home and like a good drug addict, I hid just a little bit, just in case I couldn't get into Crossroads that day. So I did the rest of my stuff and I threw it in the dumpster outside. And I threw all my rigs, my spoon, my cottons, everything else, I threw it all in there. I threw my phone away. And now I wake up Thursday morning withdrawing 
sick as, as hell, throwing up, shitting all over the place. And the only thing that can go through my mind is your used rigs and your spoon and cottons are out in the dumpster and the trash doesn't come out till Friday. So it's Thursday, it's still there. And there's just a bunch of papers in the back and that's it. And uh, like a good drug addict, man, I hop into that dumpster and say so they gotta be under the papers. You know, so I start searching around and, and I and nothing there. So I go to hop out and uh, there's people walking by staring at me. And uh, that really hit, man. I'm just like, I am literally in a dumpster right now looking for used syringes. I'm like, whoa. Like I get out of the dumpster and I start walking back and my mind says, maybe you threw them in the other dumpster because there's two dumpsters right next to each other. So of course, you know, I, I get in the dumpster and, and look again, and there's nothing in there. So I detoxed on the floor. Somehow I made it till Monday and I go into treatment at Crossroads, man. And uh, I was that drug addict that l this literally happened to uh, a dude who I got admitted with. His parents had taken him there. He was a young kid. And uh, she told me later on after graduation that she pointed at me and told her son, like, that guy is not going to make it. Because at this point, like, I'm 185 right now. I was 120 pounds. Like, track marks up and down my arms. Like, you know, open scabs from, from, from shooting up and missing. So I got a sponsor because they wanted me to. And, like, at this point, like, my family always told me I'm hopeless. Like, I'm never going to change nothing's ever going to come of me. Like you've wasted your life. You're, you're a lifelong heroin addict. Like they were expecting me to die in any moment. And I did too. So I heard a guy talking that saying he was at crossroads and, you know, admissions and he was 120 pounds and he was trying to holler at every girl that walked by out there. And I'm just like, that was me. Like, yeah, this is my sponsor. This is who I want to, to take me through this. I'm like, great. So this dude answered at first, but he stopped call, you know, stopped answering my phone call like four days in a row. I'm sitting up there smoking a cigarette and I, and I turn around and I see a dude walking up and I hear that voice in my head again, like clear as day, like I'm talking to you right now. It's like, there's your sponsor. I'm like, cool. And he walks up, I'm like, hey bro, I've been calling you like four days in a row, you haven't answered. And he's like, I'm not your fucking sponsor. Like, I don't even know you, but I'll take you through the steps if you want. And I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So this started my step experience, man. And uh, through, we started praying, you know, a couple couple days later, like before one of the you know, step two. And uh, this is the first time I've actually like really prayed. Like my prayers at this point consisted of like, God, please get me out of jail right now. I'm so sick and I can't handle this. Like I need to get high. Or God, like, please let my dope dealer show up in five minutes when he says five minutes. Like that's what my prayers were. So at this point, like I was actually praying for the first time in my life. Man, it felt good. The next day we're talking and uh, we're eating lunch at Crossroads. My sponsor came up there and he, he's telling me how he was in Crossroads like two months before that. He was watching a movie on his phone about a gambler. And like how many gambling movies are out there? How many movies about gambler? Millions of them, right? I stopped him right at that point. I was like, dude, don't you dare tell me it was Mississippi Grind. And he looks at me like, dude, how would you know that? Like, because two months before that, literally the same exact day that he was watching that movie, I was at home and I'm flipping through and I see a movie on there. It's called Mississippi Grind. And like that voice in my head that I hear clear as day tells me, watch this movie. And at this point, I'm like, this is, this is fucking tripping me out, dude. Like, this is crazy. Like, I want to see what else happens. Like, this is nuts. I start doing the deal, man. Like, I, I want more of this. There's no withdrawals from this feeling. As long as you do this deal, man, it, it's, you don't ever have to feel like that again is what they keep telling me. So I'm like, sick, dude, this is awesome. And so at this point, like, I was willing to turn my life over and will, and will to God. And like, out of all this that happened, like, my eyes are open now. I'm like, dude, this is, I just can't, I can't go back to that, that life anymore. Because that's not life, man. That was death. That's exactly what I was doing was killing myself, killing other people, hurting other people that personal inventory of myself, man, like I was looking at things that I was doing that were fucked up from a young age. And that solution that I look for to feel that like something's wrong was drugs. And uh, so that just proves right there, like drugs were not my problem. Like I can do drugs fine. I did drugs for 23 years straight without a problem. My problem is I don't know how to live sober. It's not just about living sober. It's about being a better person. Working with other addicts and alcoholics gives me a feeling like no other feeling in the world. That's that shot of dope I wanna chase from now on.
there's nothing better than than taking somebody through that and seeing them you get in touch with their higher power and that having changed their lives this thing is free that you feel man it doesn't charge you anything there's no admission fees there's no membership dues nothing like that man my family actually talks to me now like which is crazy i hadn't talked to them in four or five years but i don't have to tell them that i'm sober anymore i don't have to show them that i'm you know tell them i'm doing good and lie about it they know just by talking to me the way i sound over the phone you know they know i'm not doing drugs anymore my dad, I hadn't talked to him in so long. And he was, when, literally when I told him I was going to treatment, he was like, what for? It's not gonna work. There, there's nothing that I could do to argue with that, to say otherwise, because 23 years, I've tried all on my own, never to get you know to any success. And my dad's like one of those tough old school Italians who are like, you know, we, we suck it up and bottle it and deal with our problems. And if you can't, there's something wrong with you. But it worked, man. I've been sober 10 months and, and three weeks. And uh, the first time in 23 years I've ever had any sobriety whatsoever. And uh, my dad, like, you know, he, he calls me one day, I'm on the phone and he's like, hey, I got a package coming to your house that's gonna be delivered there because I need somebody to sign for it. Just the fact that he trusts me not to go sell that for dope, like that's a miracle right there. That's crazy to me. Like, I'm just like, I didn't even question it. I'm like, cool, man, awesome, I'll get it. I go home one day and the package is there, but it, it wasn't for him, man. It, he got it. He got me a guitar, like, and just surprised me with it, man. And that was like, that's just like crazy. I used to play music all the time. I hadn't played in years because you know drugs are all that mattered. I was on the phone with him, talking to him and crying my eyes out, you know, just just bawling like a baby. And uh, I, the first time since I was a kid, man, he actually told me he loved me. My family wants me to be around now. My dad actually tells me he loves me. He would never verbalize like that he cared about you. He was quick to tell you when you did something wrong, all right, but never like, you're doing a great job, you know, keep it up, I love you, anything like that. So for him to say that, that's like a huge milestone right there. That's just what I cherish every single day, man. You know, I don't have the greatest job in the world anymore. You know, just a job right when I got from treatment, but I wake up every day happy. You know, sometimes to the point it makes my roommate sick because I wake up at 5.30 in the morning just happy to be awake and alive. And uh, I don't have to be dependent on drugs anymore to get through my day. You know, I'm dependent on life. I'm able to be there and I get to be there, man. I wake up and I get to pray. I get to go to work. You know, I get to be in this room on this camera right now, man. And, and uh, those are just miracles, man, that keep happening every day. I don't know where I'd be without, without recovery, man, without these treatment centers. They, uh, they really help people, man. If you're out there struggling, and you don't know what to do, man, get yourself into treatment, man. There's hope out there. You're better than what you're doing right now, man. Detox to Rehab wants to help as many people as possible and do it the right way. Please subscribe, comment, and like our channel. Thank you for watching.